In a Nuera village in East Africa, a man tells of his culture, sings of his world. All my bulls have bells on their necks. My spotted bull glitters like lightning. He is white like a bird in ashes. He is so bright. Across the earth can be heard the lilt and the cadence of different languages. Each language growing, changing, separating us and at the same time binding us together into groups. Each language is a framework for our feelings, our dreams, our distinct and varied cultures. Between three and five thousand languages are known to exist in the world today. Each language is of equal importance to anthropologists. For language is the primary vehicle through which culture is shared and transmitted. It is through language we learn our culture, how to participate in it, to see the worlds around us. We hear a continuum of sounds in our language, and we're able to convert those sounds into meaning. We have an idea, and we're able to express that idea in sounds. In a sense, that's what language is all about. It connects meaning with sound and translates sound into meaning. Because we're human and have human brains, and because we've had the experiences we've had with our languages, we acquire the rules of our languages, and we have them in our head. These rules are finite. They're limited in number. Yet from these rules, we're able to produce an infinite number of sentences. We can understand sentences we've never heard before. We can utter sentences we've never heard before. In the world of nature, all creatures transmit a variety of sounds, movements, and odors to communicate with each other. Gray lag geese perform a dance before mating. Tropical perch compete for territory. The loser indicates submission by displaying colored stripes on its body. Army ants leave trails of chemicals to pass information in their foraging for food. Each chemical pattern a distinct message. The dance of the honeybee signals specific information about the distance and direction to pollen. But no matter how many messages or calls an animal may have in its repertory, each is mutually exclusive. One might be a request for female companionship, another a warning of danger. But animals cannot combine parts of two calls or gestures to make a new meaning. The communication is closed. Please, machine, give piece of Banana. Period. There may be one exception to the closed communication rule in the non-human world. Language may not be the sole prerogative of human beings. Some years ago, at the Yerkes Primate Center, a chimp, Lana, was taught to press keys on a computer-controlled console to make sentences. By pressing the appropriate keys, she is able to communicate her desire to drink water, to hear music, see a movie, Thus, Lana shows a continuity of language between the animal and human worlds. Her achievements suggest that the symbolic and linguistic capacity of our closest cousins, the chimps, may be very much like that of young humans. 
But chimps do not have the vocal apparatus and accompanying behavior of humans. Their efforts at communicating are a far cry from human speech. Only human language, in its spoken and symbolic character, permits an infinite number of combinations and recombinations of meaning. Human language is an open system of communication built on the uttering of a few simple sounds combined to produce different and distinct meanings. There is, according to legend, a boiling pot of gold at one end. A linguist look at language, at the structure of language, on a number of different levels. On the level of sound itself, or the phonological level, linguists are interested in isolating the building blocks of sound called phonemes. Now, phonemes are sounds in languages which don't have meaning in and of themselves, but which signal differences in meaning. For example, in English, consider the difference between the words bit and pit. Now, they differ minimally, only in difference in terms of the first sound. One begins with a B and one begins with a P. One is voiced and one is, is not voiced. We hear those differences in sounds, that difference in sounds, and we uh, recognize and understand different words. On a slightly higher level of linguistic analysis, we come to the morphological level. Morphemes, you can consider, for example, words morphemes. Individual words such as uh, walk is a morpheme. In itself, it contains meaning. Uh, morphemes also are not necessarily individual words. Consider walked, for example. The T on the end of the walked signals past tense. It's a bound morpheme. It can't exist by itself, but it does signal uh, meaning. And in and of itself, it has meaning. How does human language come about? How is it acquired? The process is universal a biological maturation occurring in the same sequence to all children in all cultures. What some call a built-in language acquisition device. Recent research pinpoints the first weeks of life as crucial. The child learns the patterning of sound and behavior in social interaction. At the end of ten months, the child babbles in the sounds of the culture. By two years, it telegraphs meanings in one- and two-word utterances, which are mini versions of adult language. The acquisition of language is a major accomplishment for every human learned in interaction with adult and peer. By three, the child has a vocabulary of hundreds of words, increasing at a faster and faster rate as the child grows. Lobster. 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 Becky? Lobster. Lobster. Lightning. Lobster. At the same time that the vocabulary of the child increases, there is a drive toward the sense of the language, a grappling with metaphor, with syntax, and with grammatical structure. The child masters the language in the context of a total culture. The language of the culture is now set. Stop that arm. I can kill you. I'm to wake you up. I'm going to give you a beast now. I'm going to give you only milk and cheer and dinner. The monsters give you. I'm going to buy a car and dinner. A whole bunch of dinner. The level of syntax has to do with the combination of uh, words into sentences and the kinds of meanings that those combinations convey. Uh, for example, in the English sentence, John saw Mary, we know that it is John doing the seeing and, and Mary the one who is seen. Uh, if we reverse the word order, Mary saw John, then we know that Mary is the one doing the seeing. Uh, syntax through variation in word order signals differences in meaning, conveys that sort of relational meaning. It, of course, can get much more complex than that. For example, if we consider the sentence, the man who lives by the river 
uh, that I introduced you to last night is not going to join us on our picnic because he's heard on the radio that it's going to rain. We've taken a number of uh, small ideas in English, uh, smaller sentences, and combined them through our rules of syntax into a single sentence which conveys a great number of relational sorts of meanings. Now, all those that are here, raise your hand. Every culture has its own codes of meaning. Words and sentences only make sense when they are part of a total cultural pattern. The comedian, Professor Irwin Corey, illustrates this point by manipulating language to create a comic world of double talk. We've got to... reconnoit. Reiterate, reaffirm the developing aspects whereby we can ascertain with impunity those who accept the obligations and realize the necessity of continuing that iota whereby we can accept and feel that salvation is its own reward. Many of people... Every language is an ongoing performance and each consists of more than words and sentences. How something is said is often as important as what is said. Somebody whistling would be just a distraction to any cab driver. Paralangue, accent, pitch, cadence, tone, also contribute to meaning. There's one surefire way to get a cab, to raise your hand directly above your head and hold it up. Then a driver who's seeing 10,000 things every two minutes can clearly distinguish the one person from everything else going on from people crossing the street, from people looking at their watch, people touching their hair, people talking with other people. You see these Italians, they're always speaking with their hands. They're always moving their hands. You would think they need a taxi, but they don't. They're merely conversing with someone next to them. Here's a young woman, she's touching her hair. She's very attractive. She'd be a good taxi trip, but I know she's only crossing the street. You've got to see... Like all of us, the cabbie relies on another aspect of language, kinesics or body language to read meaning. Here's a great guy right here with the conservative hairstyle, the suit. Looks like he's from right around here on the east side of Manhattan. He's got his attache case, his sunglasses. It'd be a great trip out there in a big tip. We use body language in a variety of ways. We can use space and distance to say many things. We send messages without words through facial expressions, eye contact, gestures, and hesitations. We learn how to send these messages from our culture. Shall we embrace or just shake hands? Culture decides. We manipulate body movements and ritualize them in codes. Among the Japanese in their tea ceremony, even the shaping of silence is highly ritualized. Each gesture by itself is designed to speak a distinct meaning. Each simple movement is a symbol for a part of the truth expressed poetically. The codes of any language are shaped by and emerge from a specific social and historical heritage. Alongside standard American English, black English, for example, has developed its own rich pattern of language and code. A toast is a narrative or an epic poem. Uh, a lot of them are very... Claudia Kernan, an anthropologist, studies the situational use of language, sociolinguistics, among black Americans. You know, the term black English is a very recent vintage. When's the first time you ever heard that term? Well, originally I heard the term Negro dialect growing up, and then it changed to black dialect during the 60s. And really, until I got into the university, I hadn't heard the term black English. What, what, what are the most interesting things that you've learned about the dialect? I've learned about how the culture of black people breathed the language, uh, would breed a type of different way of communicating. Uh, in my own observation, I've, I've learned that I think black people who speak black English do so because it is a more figurative, uh, a more feeling, a more accurate kind of a language. Uh, for example, 
if it's cold, it, in standard English, it's very cold out here. And uh, this chill is about to get to me. In black English, man, this hawk is biting out here. I'm getting out of here. This chill is going to cut me down. Uh, it really tells how you really feel about things. Um, you know, the the term rapping, you all heard that term, is a, is a piece of the metal language of uh, black American verbal culture. And as it was originally used, it described a very fluent and lively way of talking, particularly male talk. Um, and rapping is now being used in a very, very special kind of sense. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the rapping started in prison where the inmates with a lot of time on their hand would make up these verses uh, to the uh, existing music on the radio. So now uh, these former inmates have become really popular in the pop music scene and introduced the rap record. So I'm going to give you a little example of a rap record. Okay, so I want a little beat, you know, where everybody's like this. Okay. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. My son said, Daddy, I don't want to go to school because the teacher's a jerk. She must think I'm a fool. And all the kids smoke reefer. I think it'd be cheaper if I just got a job and became a street sweeper. Wear a shirt and tie, shuffle my feet, dance to the beat, and run with the freak. Because it's all about money. Ain't a damn thing funny. You got to have a car in this land of milk and honey. Don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head <laughs> it's like a jungle sometimes it makes me wonder how i keep from going under <laughs> it's like a jungle sometimes it makes me wonder how i keep from going under <laughs> you grow up in an all-black community as i did uh you don't really feel very different and you don't have a, you don't think about things like black english black culture i mean the way you, what you learn is what everybody else does. And you behave like other people in the community behave. Uh, anybody ever, for, do you recall, for example, when, the first time you realized that you spoke differently than other people? This is merely the situation where um, I came to UCLA coming from basically an all-black environment, all-black high schools, and fat fact, predominantly black educators. I saw myself changing, actually, at my first year of college. Um, the nasal... Uh, the quality of my speech changing. Uh, the use uh, when I stopped using double negatives. So I had just the opposite experience from you. You know, where you feel the pressure to speak more standard. I kind of feel this pressure to speak more in Black English because, like, my upbringing was like all in like a strictly standard English white school environment. So when I got to uh, uh, area where there were more blacks and when I opened my mouth the blacks looked at me like you know where's this guy come from and even the whites were looking like well you know man are you sure you want to sound like that I mean you know you sound like a little bit too white for the way you look you know so now as I get older I kind of am trying to modify my speech so that uh, I sound more black so that you know I can communicate better with you know blacks and consequently with whites what we are confronting basically are different grammatical rules. Our dialect uh, is the sort of output of a very different, of a somewhat different system of rules than standard English. But as you live in this society, you receive many, many subtle messages, sometimes not so subtle, that things that emanate out of black culture uh, are to be valued less. And in some ways, it's been this sort of revolution in, in black consciousness that has made people like us really begin to focus on our culture as something worthy of study, uh, just like any other culture, and focus on our heritage as a rich heritage, as a, an important component of the human experience, something that we should try to conserve and something that we should try to understand. Every language is a tool for survival, a matter of life and death for a culture and its people. The Ewam, a people on the Sepik River in New Guinea, provide a startling example of this. The Ewam live by hunting and by eating a starchy paste made from the palm tree. To eat the paste is to make the throat happy. For the Ewam, the throat is the same as the soul. It is the center of life. This twist of language is crucial to them, for it structures how they perceive the world and how they act upon it. 
This woman is in a coma. But though she is living, she is about to be buried alive. She is moving, but she cannot speak. Her throat cannot speak. It is dead. So to her people, she is dead. She is placed in a shallow grave and covered with fronds. This incident illustrates what some linguists and anthropologists believe to be a central feature of language, that by providing habitual grooves of expression, it predisposes people to see the world in a certain way. It shapes the way they think and behave, their very perception of reality, even of what is alive and what is not. The relationship between thought and language is a complex one. Does thought influence language? Does language influence thought? Now, what that means is that somehow the categories that our language imposes upon the world and which we habitually use influence the way we think of the world. Languages talk about such things as causality, as time, in different kinds of ways. A, pe a person using a particular language, habitually using a, a particular language that talks about time in a way, in a particular way, may uh, begin to perceive time that way, to conceptualize time that way, and to conceptualize time in a different way than a person who speaks a language that talks about time in a different way. In the world of the Hopi Indian, the linguist Benjamin Worf found that there were no words in their language to express a specific period of time. They could not in their own language say, three hours long, or a stretch of time. According to Worf, time to the Hopi was an indefinite, undividable quality of experience. Worf felt that because there were no words to express such a specific period of time, the Hopi were not able to conceive of the passage of time in the same way that we and many other people do. Worf's view that reality is shaped by language is not totally embraced by other linguists and anthropologists. They feel that language also reflects reality, and as reality changes, so too will a language. Among the Nuer of Africa's Sudan, cattle are at the core of the tribe's way of life. Their importance requires the creation of a wide variety of words to describe them. The day begins with the task of collecting and milking the cattle. They are the source of food, the subject of raids and wars. The boy takes his name from his cattle, and it walks with him throughout his life. Brown with the white spots, shining horns twisted. There are over 400 cattle words in the Nuer language. In their vocabulary, subtle combinations of color patterns parts of the body, and the shape of the horns are all elaborated. Cattle words are the focus of their vocabulary. They are used in greeting each other. They give symmetry to their art and ritual. They are the substance of their imagery and chant. taste, and milk will be there before grain is ripe. Being nomadic pastoralists, the New Air's homeland has no borders, only the relationships of tribe, kin, and cattle. There are no words to express more formal boundaries. They would be of no use. Their world is reflected by their language. Whether language shapes our reality or whether it is simply a reflection of reality. It is an intimate part of our cultural perceptions and view of the world. Language allows us to share our cultures, 
to pass them on, to make each culture both separate and sensible to its participants. They can't go to the because of the gang activity. Each culture chooses to recognize different units of sound and meaning, to blend in a syntax that contains all we wish to understand and act upon. Our earth is webbed by the sounds of human languages. They represent our need to communicate with and know one another. A desire so strong that we now wish to reach beyond our own planet. Our earth is only one of billions of planets in the universe. Now we are actually listening for messages from outer space and sending messages to anyone who might be listening. It is our hope that one day our languages will enable us to communicate with others beyond our own world, others we can now only imagine.